Good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the 11th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee? Can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? Please note that Phil McGregor and Ross Thompson are both on a fact-finding visit to the SQA to inform next week's pre-budget scrutiny, and Tavi Scott will be late arriving to the meeting as he is flying in from Shetland this morning. The first item of business is a decision to take two items in private. In this week's meeting, item four will be a review of the evidence we hear this morning on the Legislative Consent Memorandum, and next week there will be an item where we consider our work programme. Are members content that we consider both of these items in private? Agreed. Thank you. The second item of business is an evidence session on Legislative Consent Memorandum, LCM S54, on the Higher Education and Research Bill. And I welcome to the meeting Professor Leslie Yellowlees, Fellow at the Royal Society of Edinburgh, my apologies, Mary Senior, UCU Scotland Official, University and College Union Scotland, Alistair Sim, Director of University Scotland, and Philip White, Policy and Influencing Officer, National Union of Students Scotland. Good morning. I believe that you want to make an opening statement. It's just the SFC. Oh, the SFC. Next panel. Oh, excuse me. I'm daydreaming. <laughs> uh, right, we'll move straight to questioning. Before I ask the first question, can I remind members and inform witnesses that wherever possible, questions and answers should be focused, and members should make clear which particular witness they want to answer a particular question. I would also uh, remind members and the panel that we've got a lot to go through today and we have quite a tight timetable. So, Can I ask um, the Mary Senior about the UCU's position on this bill, as I believe it differs from... Yes, uh, thank you, convener. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to speak to the committee today because I think we have some very serious concerns about the legislative consent motion, um, particularly in the way that the LCM um, links <coughs> Scottish institutions with the UK government's um, higher education and research bill. Now, I think this is a bill that UCU has, has been opposing at UK level um, because uh, of what it does. Um, it basically um, introduces the teaching excellence framework, um, albeit the bill uh, doesn't actually um, reference the TEF, it provides the mechanism to allow the teaching excellence framework to come into being. And, and this is going to be a competitive way, um, a, a, a really marketised way of, of measuring um, <coughs> education. And in, at the at UK level, the reason for the teaching excellence framework is to uh, supposedly measure quality, uh, but allow institutions in England to increase tuition fees and it seems really ironic that um, the Scottish Government and clearly has a very different position and a position that UCU is very much welcomed <coughs> um, in relation to um, enabling uh, Scottish domiciled students to access uh, education without tuition fees. So it seems really ironic that we have uh, that system in Scotland and then um, a legislative consent motion which is going to allow um, Scottish universities to sign up to the teaching excellence framework. Um, we feel the metrics are are flawed, um, the, the metrics are around student destinations after university and are around um, student satisfaction, which again, there's a lot of evidence um, which raises questions in relation to um, the value of student satisfaction survey. So, so the legislative consent motion is going to allow universities in Scotland to be able to sign up to um, a system that the UK government says it's going to introduce, which is about um, increasing tuition fees. So there seems to be a real, you know, real difficulty um, in this. And, um, and I think, to be fair to our institutions in Scotland, I think they've been put in a very unfortunate position um, because clearly um, universities in Scotland uh, want to be attractive, want to, to compete globally and to the rest of the UK. And so there's a sense that some institutions are thinking, well, you know, we need to be in TEF because we need to have our teaching uh, graded and assessed in, the, in that way. And so we need to get either you know, TEF is going to award a gold, silver or bronze um, 
category to um, institutions based on their teaching. Um, so institutions such as the University of Edinburgh or the University of St Andrews feels that they'll be left behind um, if, they, if they don't sign up. And, and our fear is we're going to get a domino um, effect um, for all institutions in Scotland feeling <coughs> that they need to... Um, to participate when, in fact, Scotland already has very effective quality assurance mechanisms for that review our teaching, that are very much peer-reviewed, uh, which look at quality and a, and a very much a holistic assessment um, around looking and measuring at teaching. And I think all of us on the panel, um, obviously my colleagues will speak for themselves, but you know I, I'm very <coughs> confident that, they, that they're going to say that Scotland has a very effective quality assurance mechanism um, as regards measuring our teaching. Um, I'd also say I, th I think we're, we're hearing some worrying things from the UK government in relation to um, overseas um, students and we, we've heard some worrying <coughs> comments around linking the award that TEF is going to give institutions to, um, to being able to um, bring in more students from overseas, i.e. linking with immigration issues. Which again, you know, I think the narrative around um, immigration has been, has been deeply worrying from the UK government. But to hear that in the same, um, you know, you know, the, the same dialogue around um, TEF um, is, you know, is deeply <coughs> worrying. Um, I, I guess I'd also say to the committee, I know um, the Scottish government is currently um, looking at education governance, um, early years uh, school education, uh, and in that, the cabinet secretary says. Evidence shows that cooperation and co collaboration, not competition or marketisation, drives improvement. You know, and I'd absolutely agree uh, with the Cabinet Secretary in relation to that point. Uh, but I think it's really worrying that um, we have this legislative consent motion, which um, you know seeks to enable Scottish institutions to participate in a system that we think is going to be flawed, which we, we're not going to have effective um, controls and influence over, uh, and, and, and is really around privatisation and marketisation and, and being able to increase tuition fees. Um, in England, which is inevitably going to have a knock-on effect um, in Scotland. Thanks very much for that. I, I know the Scottish Government are still in correspondence with the, the UK <coughs> Government about many uh, sections of this. Does anybody from the panel want to comment on that, Alistair? Um, well, I probably ought to comment just from the point of view um, of University of Scotland representing um, Scotland's university leaders. Um, I think that, you know, the, the, the teaching excellence framework um, has presented um, institutions with actually, I think, quite a difficult choice that they, they, they want to make at institutional level, which is do, do you participate or not? Now, um, entirely agreeing with Mary, I think what we've got in Scotland already are enhancement-led institutional review process, which puts students at the centre um, and is really driven by peer review and, and improvement rather than being a sort of audit-driven process. You know, that, that's something we value. Um, and wish to retain across the sector. It, it, it's, it's, it, it works well and has driven student-centred improvement. Um, but the TEF does present institutions with a dilemma. I mean, basically, um, we're working in an extremely competitive environment. Um, if you want to be able to attract students from the rest of the UK, if you want to be able to attract students internationally, you want to be able to say, um, in, in as validated a way as possible, um, that what you're offering a student is of of top quality, and I think institutions are conscious of the potential for competitive disadvantage um, if their English peers are able to say, look, we've got a gold medal for um, being a brilliant place for students, um, and, and they haven't. So it's a genuine um, dilemma for, for institutions that they are working through individually. Um, and um, I think essentially we're, we're, we're pursuing twin tracks on this. One is to get more influence on the development of the teaching excellence framework itself. And over the past um, weeks and months, I would say since the middle of the summer, we have a lot more traction with the um, Department for Education in, in Whitehall on that. We're starting to get sensible work on the metrics for TEF. We're starting to get much more involved in the, the governance and quality assessment of TEF. So you know, some of our concerns have been met. And in parallel, we're thinking, well, what is, are other things we can do in Scotland that would make the Scottish system um, able to, to, to represent um, you know, the, the, the highest levels of quality in a way that persuades people from um, rest of the UK and international markets. So there, there, there are choices there, and I think we, you know, we support 
um, the legislative consent motion from the point of view that it will enable institutions to make those choices about whether participation in the TEF is going to help them to uh, draw students from um, the rest of the UK and around the world to Scotland in a way that contributes to our overall social and economic well-being. Okay, thanks very much for that. Does anybody, Professor Lowell? Uh, thank you. Um, the Royal Society of Edinburgh is broadly supportive. It's, it has two main concerns. That is of earlier the enhancement led. We would, would like to see that. We would want to see that retained in Scotland because we think it works to our benefit, uh, just as Alistair said, far more than the audit system does. And I think we would want to support that. And I think we'd also want a broad recognition that the Scottish education system is different from the rest of the UK. And I'm not sure that that's fully recognised in the bill at present. And I think we have to push that forward because uh, we are firmly, I think all of us are firmly behind that, the differences but that we want those recognised and we want those taken account of. Okay, thanks for that. Mr White, do you have um, Just to reiterate what much of the panel has already said, that the bill for us is an interesting one and that actually the bulk of it is taken up by research, which Leslie and Alistair can speak to much more than we can. Um, however, what it does obviously do is enable TEF through the creation of the Office for Students. Um, and I think to reiterate what a lot of the panel have said, I note that the Minister in one of her original letters to the committee said that it remains to be seen how TEF will be viewed in the international stage. I have to say I still think it's to be seen how it will be viewed in the UK stage. There has been talk that essentially for Scottish universities it is nothing more than a marketing tool by which they can draw equivalence with the rest of the UK. It remains to be seen if it will even achieve that. And I think it's important to remember that what TEF will do is provide a snapshot of one particular point in time. <clears throat> what the Scottish system does is encourage you know, much more granular and much more ongoing enhancement of quality. And it's enhancement of quality that is led and driven at every level by students. And so just reiterating what everyone else in the panel has said, I think it's absolutely vital that no matter what happens with TEF across the UK and what that looks like in Scotland, that we do our absolute utmost to protect the Scottish system that we do have and allow no diminution in terms of the quality excellence framework that we currently have. Okay, thank you. Joanne? I'm interested to know what your equivalent organisations in the rest of the United Kingdom think about the bill. I mean, the suggestion that in Scotland we've got this much better system, why would educationalists in other parts of the United Kingdom not want to, or would not share your concerns about the implications of this bill? That's the first point. The second point is really a question around this fear that this will be used as a means of justifying bumping up tuition fees. But would you not accept that currently there is a cross-subsidy from fee tuition fees being paid in Scotland by non, well, by English students, frankly, which allows the government to underfund places at Scottish universities currently. Does anybody want to respond to that? Respond on that. I mean, I think um, looking at the UK level, I mean, our, 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 our partner organisation in, in England, uh, the Universities UK, um, I think is working through in detail um, quite a lot of concerns about the bill um, and in particular um, concerns about whether the bill increases government control over universities. But I think in principle, um, the broadly, they, they, they see the, the teaching excellence framework, if it can be done well, and that really is a question, um, as being something that, that may be of benefit because it does... Um, kind of introduce a sort of competitive element to making sure you're doing the best for a student if it's done well, and I, I, I do, do add that proviso. Um, I think in terms of um, the, the cross-subsidy element, I mean, two, two things are important. One is um, even a lot of rest of UK students um, at Scottish universities are actually paying less than it costs to provide their courses. Um, if you're studying medicine um, at, uh, at a Scottish university, for instance, um, a fee of £9,000 or so is not going to cover the costs of um, the university teaching you that course. Um, so there's actually still an element of, of Scottish public funding um, going into that. Um, in terms of our ability to attract international students, um, you know, I'll be frank, there, there is a cross-subsidy there. Um, if we can charge market rates for international students and if branding Scottish universities as having the highest levels of quality and student satisfaction is important. That That's hugely important, first of all, to um, the universities, I mean, obviously financially, because we're underfunded 
for publicly uh, supported activities. So we absolutely rely on international students for plugging that gap. But it's also vital for, for Scotland's economy. I mean, we reckon the, the, the economic impact of um, international students in Scotland is well over £400 million a year. Um, and uh, we need to compete to, to, to sustain and grow that in circumstances that are made extremely challenging by, um, by the immigration regime that, that we work in and that may potentially get worse. Can I just clarify if the NUS at UK level are opposing the bill? Yeah, I was just going to come in. Um, they have, so certainly from their perspective, there are a number of positives actually that come out of the bill, not least the fact that data becomes much more transparent, not least the fact that institutions are required to prepare and access participation plans. So there are a number of positives that exist within the Office for Students. Where the main concern, so just literally in the last 24 hours, um, an amendment has been brought forward to ensure mm -hmm. some form of student representation on the Office for Students, which previously the bill didn't allow for. I think where the real concerns have come through, as I said, TEF will provide for a snapshot. It will provide on the basis of current metrics, which is the way that they're recorded, collected, and then produced, I mean that actually by the time that they're public, they're at least one year, if not two or three years, out of date. So actually, TEF will not allow for you to say substantively that in one given year, an institution is doing well, purely or neutral on any one of the metrics, because actually, they're out of date. And I think that's where the concerns have come through, that there's no substantive measures to actually genuinely improve quality there and then, but instead is yet another exercise that essentially produces league tables and everything else without really addressing the root causes of quality. In terms of fees, um, I think there's a real danger of TEF and what it means across the UK, but particularly looking between Scotland and the rest of the UK, which is there's almost a double trap within all of this, which is the Minister's letter you know, rightly states that at no <coughs> point will TEF be linked to the level of our UK fees in Scotland. That's absolutely correct. You know, setting aside everything else, we're very keen to avoid a market in higher education whereby different courses, different institutions are allowed to vary their fees based on what we think is a flawed metric through TEF. So that's one side of it. But actually, the other side is then the paradox that exists is the fact that 9250 is at present the maximum the Scottish universities are allowed to charge. But that's the maximum that English universities are allowed to charge. And as we get further down the line, that could be the maximum or the maximum could be raised that if you're a gold standard university in England doing absolutely amazingly well in terms of TEF, you can charge that upper amount. If you're not doing so well or in fact have disengaged from TEF, you can't charge that amount. However, in Scotland, as things stand, by not linking a TEF, which is the right thing to do, you actually only have that one maximum amount which means that every Scottish university, if they so choose, can <coughs> race to the top in terms of that amount, and there's no recognition, actually, of either the four-year degree system versus three-year degrees in Scotland. There's no recognition, actually, of differing standards that you could essentially see a race to the top that doesn't allow for any differentiation or the fact that Scottish universities don't have to adhere to many of the same requirements that English universities do that for their participation in TEF or through the Office for Students. I hope that made sense. Yeah, I know Mary Senior wants to come in, but uh, Richard, do you want to ask your question and then if you want to respond to it? Just to ask if, say, two universities in Scotland decide to apply to the Scottish Minister for consent to get involved in the teaching excellence framework, where do you think that will lead the rest of the Scottish universities? And do you think there will be a long-term consequence for the distinctive nature of university education in Scotland? On the first one, I don't know. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll make individual decisions. Um, decisions will have been made by the 26th of January for joining in the next round of TEF. Um, I think it'll be a very picture. I don't know exactly where it'll end up. Um, but um, the TEF itself is, is such an evolving picture. You know, I think institutions will actually be making year and year a decision. Is this really um, to our advantage or is it not to our advantage? And in particular, it's extremely uncertain what subject level um, TEF will look like, and I think you know, universities will be making a fresh judgment on that. In terms of um, would it change the character of um, Scottish higher education, I just genuinely don't think so. Um, you know, I think our, our, our values are, are deeply intrinsic in what we do. Um, if we're participating in TEF, we're participating because, um, you know, first of all, um, it enables us to, 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 to get 
um, an external validation of the fact that we're doing excellent things for uh, for students, um, <clears throat> and um, you know also because it, in in some ways some institutions may judge that it does help them to 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 address the student experience or at least give them a challenge of, of addressing the student experience. Um, but I don't think there's anything that it does that would drive an intrinsically different set of values that, that we would bring um, to, to higher education uh, or, or that would lead universities to want to undermine what, what um, Philip and Mary referred to as our deeply student-centred approach to quality enhancement. Mary you wanted to come in earlier. Yeah, I suppose in, in response to the, the most recent question, um, I think there'll be incredible and increasing pressure on institutions to participate because if just a handful um, of institutions are participating, the others are going to feel left behind and are, and are going to feel that pressure to um, participate too. Um, I think the consequences are unknown. Um, in my first contribution, I, you know, I, I referenced um, how it's going to link in with the immigration and the ability of institutions to um, bring in students from overseas, so that's a question. I think in terms of the metrics, um, we feel there's going to be establishing a pressure to dumb down course content or inflate grades because what well, a key metric is <coughs> student satisfaction and you know that, that brings a whole range of factors into play um, which I think would raise lots of different questions and you know we really don't want to see um, I suppose a dumbing down of um, the robustness of our, of, of our system but if that means um, you receive better student satisfaction scores, what's the pressure on institutions going to be to um, to, to do that? Um, I guess just to um, go back to um, Joanne Lamont's original question in relation to um, the response to the bill at, at a UK level, certainly the trade unions have been uh, very opposed to the bill. We've, you know, we've been making that clear um, throughout its, um, its passage. Um, I, I think there's been um, an incentive for um, English higher education institutions to be supported because the bill's been very clear. It's the mechanism with which they can increase tuition fees. Um, you know, there's that very clear link between TEF and the ability to, to, to bring more resource into institutions. So you can naturally see uh, why institutions would want to um, be able to draw more funding to, you know, to be able to do, to do more. Um, there's some worrying other aspects of the bill which, you know, obviously are not for debate here. But, I mean, one of the things the bill provides for is um, new providers and private providers um, into the sector in England. So, you know, at one extreme, you know, we're going to have a University of Trump in, in England, but that's in effect <coughs> what the bill um, provides for. And, it, you know, it might seem, um, you know, sensationalist to say that, um, but, you know, those pressures are going to be there. And I think in Scotland, you know, at least, you know, we've, we've got a very clear idea of um, education being for public good. Um, you know, we, we do have a good system. Um, so, I th you know, I think that's why it's very worrying to see this LCM and to see aspects of the bill being, um, being drawn into play. Okay, thank you. Professor, you want to come in and then we're going to move on to research. Okay, thank you. Um, just briefly to say that I, uh, I think that Scottish institutions want to play on an international play. That's where we see ourselves playing. And if TEF comes in, I think we're going to feel huge pressure in Scotland to join in or take part. But I would want us in this intervening period just now to be able to exert what influence and pressure that we can to make sure that the differences in Scotland and the pride with which we hold education in Scotland is well understood south of the border and those differences are celebrated by us and recognised by them and then taken forward as such. I think we can't afford to take the foot off the pedal and we've got to engage fully. If I think we need to move on, that's right, very, quick, very quickly. I suppose just uh, before we move on to research on that point, TEF will be essentially a marketing exercise in Scotland because of the way that it's set up. 
And I don't think that risks the Scottish sector that we have, provided, as I said, there's no diminution, and more importantly, that TEF isn't projected as being the more important rating than your QAA rating or your institutional-led reviews or anything else, provided that the Scottish sector pushes that and there's no diminution. We've already heard rumblings of a double burden being created between the Scottish system and TEF. That's hugely worrying. Oh, sorry, a double burden in terms of workload, of having to do work for TEF and having to do work for the existing Scottish quality arrangements. I think we should be very, you know, worn against that. And as I say, as long as there's no diminution and the Scottish sector is proud to show that actually what we have right now in terms of quality assurance and quality um, enhancement can be, <clears throat> is just as good as TEF, if not actually better, then actually, hopefully, there shouldn't be any risk of Scottish universities falling behind because we should be projecting and, you know, exemplifying what it is that we currently have in place. I'm going to move on just now to research, but we may well come back to TEF if there's other questions to be asked. Liz. Thank you, Convener. Just before we do go to research, can I just ask one point about process, given that uh, amendments are being laid to this bill and given the comments uh, that have been uh, well articulated this morning? Is it helpful uh, that this committee plays a role in submitting uh, to uh, the House of Lords, actually, will be the first one to uh, take this further, uh, and then possibly back to the House of Commons, to ensure that the, uh, the teaching excellence framework, which we all have some doubts about in terms of specific links, uh, th to get as much Scottish influence on the matrix of a, a teaching excellence framework <clears throat> that would be much more satisfactory than the one that you have criticised this morning. Would that be helpful? In my opinion, it would. Um, I think particularly if we can all speak with one voice, um, it then makes it much more difficult to um, speak against us. Right. So I think it would be, from, my, from, from the Royal Society of Edinburgh's point of view, yes. Good. Yeah, I guess in, in my opinion, we, you know, we need to do all we can to make this as less onerous um, and to impact it in a softer way as possible, and to you know, and to get rid of some of the, the more dangerous elements. You know, because this really is about increasing fees. Um, you know, it's something that the Conservative government at Westminster are pushing. So we really need to use the influence that we have um, to, to argue why this isn't appropriate for Scotland, and do what we can to um, dilute those elements. I think from, from my perspective, yes, I mean, you know, we, 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 we have our foot in the door of the committee's support for making sure that we are robustly um, at the table to influence the TEF is, is important. Um, I have to say, there's also an underlying worry that was just referred to earlier, which is um, what would happen if the Home Office, in our view, ineptly decided to link TEF gradings to your entitlement to recruit international students. Now, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. Um, every institution in Scotland is robustly quality assured. Yeah. I don't think there's any justification whatsoever for using um, TEF ratings um, to say whether you're allowed to recruit international okay. students or not. But I think there's a risk in there. Um, and I think it's a very, very serious risk if the Home Office were to do that. Um, Yeah, I mean, obviously, this, this bill is largely about research as well, and uh, Scotland's excellence uh, in research is something that has come through all the uh, papers that you have presented to the committee. Uh, and it's basically one of the, the, the most important reasons why Scotland has been punching well above its weight. There are concerns about uh, the, the way in which this bill uh, might interrupt some of the funding for that research. Um, Professor Yellowlees, you spoke on behalf of the Royal Society about this in terms of uh, having a body that would be responsible for UK research at the same time uh, as English uh, research. I mean, could you just expand on the practicalities of what your concern would be for some Scottish institutions? Uh, yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> so uh, you've wrapped several things up into that, uh, to that one statement. Um, I think that where we have support for the research elements of this bill is where it's trying to tackle interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research. Um, I think this comes particularly out of the nurse review um, and just how it was that we were missing a lot of funding opportunities in the UK for interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research. And so we applaud that. However, I think we have concerns that um, in addressing that, we don't then uh, weaken the research councils and their championing of specific areas. And I think it's important to understand 
that the areas of research that we have rut uh, routinely funded up until now using the various research councils still has a place, still has to take part, and I think that's still uh, a large element of what they will do. And so we find ourselves uh, supporting the uh, setting up of UKRI. But within that umbrella, we would wish to see the individual research council's positions still the strength it has. So that is where we would see that. I think that taking into, into this same umbrella of the Office for Students of Research England then causes us some difficulties in Scotland, wherein that the UKRI then has, I think, not to be too parochial about it, is that it, Research England would have a an unfair advantage. Mm -hmm. It's under the same umbrella. It's talking directly with the research council. It's all in together. And I think we fear for what happens for our devolved system that we have in Scotland. How do we have a voice in that? Is our voice fully heard? How can we make sure that our dual funding in Scotland is properly then uh, underwritten? Uh, uh, and I know you're hearing from the Scottish Funding Council later to, to speak about that, but I think it's a real concern for us is just how unfair an advantage will Research England have in this overarching umbrella? Can I just probe uh, further yeah. on as to whether you feel that amendments to the bill, which um, make, make it very difficult for the devolved administrations to be ignored in these decisions, yeah. is that the way forward? I noticed that overnight there's, there's yes. more... Um, uh, correspondence on this and why there's been a little bit of movement there's not been enough do you believe that we have to move that little bit further to ensure that there are locks in the system that would prevent any decisions being biased to any one part of the UK yes I do think that and I think uh, because I think and we have to continually as I've said before stress the differences in Scotland and be proud of them mm. but I do think it is under threat so I would like to see quite a high barrier put in place there. In fact, I would like to see an insurmountable barrier put in place. And I would just like to see the, uh, the budgets for the, for the different schemes separated and well separated. Yeah. So I fear that, you know, OK, you can uh, via money between one and the other, but you've got to go and get uh, say-so from, from, the, from the minister. Is that sufficient? No, I don't think it is sufficient. Uh, and I think uh, my fear in all this is as well is that will we have a loud enough voice here? Now, they're saying they're going to allow one representative or, or at least one representative from the yeah. devolved uh, countries. But our system isn't the same as Wales and it isn't the same as Northern yeah. Ireland. So uh, w w can I just ask, w would the amendment that you want to see be representation from all the devolved nations? Yes, it would. Yes, it, yes, it would. Mr. And, Sim, and a big, big high wall in there as well. <laughs> Mr Sim, uh, is that something that University of Scotland would agree with? I think that would be... Um, great if we could get it. I mean, I do welcome the progress that's been made with the amendment that's been yeah. brought forward by um, the UK government. I think also it's important that we don't just look at the membership of UKRI corporately, but we look at the membership of the research councils um, below that, because I think it's important that each research council, yeah. um, in drawing its expertise from the people who are um, best expertly qualified to be on that council, are drawing a geographical spread of, of expertise, given the need to be insightful about the way things um, are, are different in different parts of the United Kingdom. Um, I agree very strongly with um, Professor Yellowbees that there really needs to be a statutory firewall between the funding of Research England um, and Innovate UK and um, UKRI uh, generally, um, because I think there is a risk here, whatever assurances are given, um, that if there isn't some sort of statutory firewall, um, the temptation is going to be to via resources um, between UK-wide uh, functions of UKRI and English-only functions of UKRI. I think we, we need that that um, pretty solid. Um, would, would it also be correct to say, Mr Sim, that if you did have that uh, firewall, that it would be easier uh, when you're attracting the collaborative investment that you require from other countries, that it would be much easier for them to know exactly where that money is being used in research? Would that be another argument that you would use to convince the Westminster government that it would be good... Uh, in terms of clarity for those people who want to invest in collaboration? Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, it's, it's one of our competitive um, advantages as a sector in Scotland is that we, we are, on the basis of our quality, phenomenally successful at bidding into the competitively uh, won 
UK-wide resources of the, of, of the research councils, and we need to be able to tell collaborators, look, um, in an uncertain world, um, that is still um, a, an undiminished pot um, that, that, that we can build collaborations through that's not going to be diminished by being siphoned off into England-only priorities. Okay. And may I just finish on, on one point? You, you've given us very strong uh, steer when it comes to TEF, and you've given us a very strong steer when it comes to the separation of the funds. Um, before we proceed, is there anything else that is a very strong steer in what you would like to see in the terms of the bill? Um, right. I mean, from my perspective on, on, on the University of Scotland's perspective on the um, research side, um, we have said we think there should be a general duty on UKRI to act in, in the interests of the entire um, United Kingdom, including its constituent devolved jurisdictions. I think that doesn't do any harm to the policy of the bill. I think it symbolically says the right thing about this being a, a UK-wide body. Um, we've talked about membership already. Um, I think um, Innovate UK um, should be under a duty to take account of the economic policies of the devolved jurisdictions as well as the UK. There are distinctive economic policies at devolved level and if um, Innovate UK is an instrument of promoting economic growth, it needs to do that in a way that is adaptable um, to the different jurisdictions rather than being driven by one set of priorities from Whitehall. Um, and we think the Secretary of State should be under a duty to consult the ministers of the devolved administrations um, when he's making decisions um, about uh, research strategy um, and about the potential environment of resources, because these are um, issues of, of UK-wide significance. The devolved administrations are big research funders. The second biggest stream of funding into Scottish universities is from, um, uh, for research is, is, is from Scottish Government through through the Funding Council. Scottish Government is also a huge investor in environmental and agricultural research, for instance. So we need to see the research effort as a collaborative one that straddles the reserved and devolved boundary. Um, and that means that the, the ministers of the devolved administrations should have the right to be consulted about the UK's overall research strategy. C can I just draw the committee's attention to what I think the new regulatory structure will do in terms of reinforcing an unhelpful division between research and teaching? I mean, obviously, we've, we've had this discussion around um, TEF and you know this is a discussion around research and i think our view is that the best teaching is informed by research um, and, and there needs to be you know, linkages clear support and collaboration between the two but you know the focus on the teaching excellence framework um, and with the new ref coming into being <coughs> where uh, it's thought that all research staff need to be returned in the ref there's a, there's a clear danger um, that we're going to get this separation between um, those that are specialising in teaching and those that will be specialising in research. And I'm not clear that's going to be helpful to our sector in the long term. Just to be clear, are you concerned that the teaching excellence framework would be used as something to dictate the research funding? Is that, is that what you're getting at? I think it's the sense that the two are being viewed very separately. Um, that you know, it, we're going to be measuring teaching separately, we're going to be measuring research separately, and in terms of the research excellence framework, um, institutions are going to need to return every member of academic staff on a research contract in the REF, so therefore are those staff are going to be asked to focus around yep. research, and, and, and we, we're going to be losing something if people um, are not going to be able to um, undertake their research, but then also deliver their teaching, and, and there's going to be collaboration between the two. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand that point, but just to be very clear about um, your, your concern <coughs> over a separation, which you yeah. uh, have, have yeah. real issue with, are you worried that the teaching excellence framework would be used as a sort of gold standard uh, for universities that might attract a higher level of research. Is that is that your bottom line of concern? Well, you know, I guess institutions are going to want to be um, good at both teaching and uh, research. So, you know, is this going to mean um, differentiation um, in terms of um, staff are either going to be channeled down a teaching road or channeled down a research road when actually there's value in both of those aspects and, and academics should be able to focus on teaching and research at, at different points in their career? Okay. So then Can I just come back um, uh, on 
other things that we'd want, want to stress. I think that uh, we know that the UK does extremely well uh, on a world scale for its research. I mean, all the metrics would point to that. And I think Scotland does even better compared to the rest of the UK. The metrics sh show that. So I think my concern in this, the research part of this bill is that by tinkering with something that is already very, very successful, and is successful by really by any measure that you care to take to, to, to point at it or to use, we end up damaging that. Uh, and so I think we have to make sure that there aren't some um, unforeseen consequences in this bill. Uh, and that is difficult to do because they're unforeseen. Um, but I think we, what we have to do is to make sure that the overarching uh, body, this UKRI, doesn't damage that and it enhances that. And I think that is difficult. So I, I, I come back to uh, Alistair Sims' point that we have to ensure that Scotland has a proper re representation on all boards, whether it's the overarching umbrella and where I would make a play again for is to make sure that the seven research councils that we currently have, I would plea for them to continue and that we have good Scottish representation on each of those as well to make sure, because I think that is the most effective way that we can ensure that what has served us very well in the past continues to serve us well in the future. Oh, did you want to come on? Just a brief supplementary to, to what you were just uh, saying, uh, uh, Mary Senior. So, I mean, that tension that you described is a sort of a long-standing one in universities. What, what is it about the current proposals which would make that worse, or is it just that, that it's sort of a, a continuing issue between teaching? Because, I mean, my understanding is that you know, research funding is not not currently linked to, to, to teaching. I mean, what, what, what's your specific concern about these proposals? Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, I, and I guess, I, I was going to say earlier, the fact that um, I guess the, the bill helps to give some status to teaching, which I think is something that everyone welcomed in, in some way, because teaching is clearly important. But actually, it stratifies it and separates it. It doesn't link it into research um, in a way How that How does that be... differ to the current regime? I think that's my slight confusion. Well, maybe it just um, inflames the current regime in a way that okay. isn't, it isn't helping the collaboration in any way. Questions around research? If not, we've given Tef a good shot, but Daniel, I believe that there's one or two questions. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, this relates to, to um, some comments that were made earlier. Um, I mean, I... I, I sort of I understand. I think the, the fundamental point here is about whether or not TEF is compatible with the standards we have here, and sure that. And I think um, Alistair Sim made some points about kind of uh, if we have confidence in our our regime, we should, in a sense, have confidence that they will bear out. However, does that not alter uh, substantially based on the composition of student numbers at the institutions? And, and a, a particular, Professor Yellowlees, I'm, I'm, I know that you're here representing the, the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I also know what institution <laughs> that you, you work at. I mean, for, for particular institutions with high levels of students from the rest of the UK, is there a more pronounced issue that they might, those institutions might get pulled in a different direction to, uh, to other institutions in Scotland? I wish I, knew, I wish I had the answer to that. I mean, that requires a, a certain amount of crystal ball gazing, which I can't do. Um, but yes, we have a concern. Uh, I mean, we want my own institution, and, and let me distance myself from the Royal Society of Edinburgh here and say my own institution has had a very proud history of being as international as it possibly can be. Um, whilst serving the needs of Scottish students as well. And we have to, to there's a fine balance to be, to be struck there. Uh, and anything that threatens that mix, threatens our ability to, to play on an international field, is one that we take very seriously and is one I have grave concerns about. So anything that threatens that, yes, of course we have concerns about it. Uh, and, and again, are there any particular points or features that, that have, uh, would need to be addressed in terms of the compatibility of TEF with our own standards or, or particular points which, w and are there any mitigation steps? Could I, and I, I'd probably put that point to ask to Sim. Um, I think there's some, some mitigation steps that, that, that are in hand. I mean, in a sense, it, they're, they're, they're different things because I mean, what we have 
true enhancement-led institutional review. It's a sort of constant journey, thinking how can we improve what we're doing for a student? Um, how do we compare to our peers on that? It's a sort of self-reflective um, process. It's, it's really rather different from TEF. But I think that, in a sense, that the problem that institutions are facing is, well, that gives you real confidence as an institution that you're doing the right thing to make the, the experience for the student right. But what it doesn't do is give you a badge that says you're excellent. It basically, um, you come out at the other end sort of a, with, with QA expressing confidence in you, and it, it doesn't, that doesn't quite hack it in, in a competitive market necessarily. So, um, so hence the interest in TEF, and um, hence the need to get its metrics right. I mean, things that we've been working on very closely are to make sure that TEF is measuring um, deprivation on a basis that makes more sense for Scotland than what was originally okay. proposed. Um, also, that given the, 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 the typically longer duration of our degrees, it's measuring retention in a way that makes sense. Um, and also that structurally, um, we've got people um, in the governance of TEF, both at programme level and at assessment of institution level, who understand the Scottish system um, and who, who can give commentary of, of, of why things are as they are. Um, so it's been important that we have been involved in yeah, what you describe as, as mitigation work, I mean, actually influencing the metrics so that if institutions um, do individually choose to go into TEF, um, they're going into something that isn't um, unfairly stacked against them. So are those points that you would, would like to see this committee perhaps raise in, in terms of its commentary that it, it, it provides elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the, the points I would like to, to, to particularly uh, make our make sure that we're measuring um, deprivation on a way that makes sense for Scotland. There are different measures in Scotland and England. If you just measure by England, uh, you disadvantage us. Make sure you're taking account of our, you know, what, what, what you're going to see in retention over longer degrees. We're not disadvantaged. Also, uh, look at the job market. I mean, you know, if, if you're looking at um, the destination of leavers from higher education at, 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 at what, where, where um, people go, um, you've got to understand that quite subtly in a UK that's got very, very, very job markets and also the institutions that have got very varied profiles yeah. of what is a successful destination for our students. I mean, frankly, if you're producing a lot of people who go on to be successful nurses, teachers and social workers, um, you need that to be recognised um, as, as much of a success as if you're producing lots of people going into highly paid professions. Um, just finally, and, and to Mary Senior, you, you, some of the comments you provided the committee about the, the, sort of the nature of the opt-in and whether or not that sort of lies with institutions or with ministers. I was just wondering if you could just maybe detail that a little bit and just explain what your concern there is about the kind of the, the decision-making powers that maybe ministers and the role they have within this uh, context. I, I mean, I, I guess it's, it's not really clear, albeit, I guess, ultimately ministers have a say as to whether Scottish institutions can participate. But our sense is very much that there's going to be a pull from institutions to participate for all the reasons that colleagues have said, that they feel they have to be in that competitive market. And our concern is that's not a good reason to be participating in, 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 in the TEF. Um, and it's drawing us all down this line of marketisation, privatisation, and, and this push for increasing uh, fee levels. Um, and yeah, you know, different universities are going to feel that uh, pressure differently. Um, you know, I, I think um, you know, I was talking to a principal on Monday who you know expressed very clearly to me that that, that he wasn't supportive of of the TEF. Um, and it was a frustration that we couldn't get the Scottish Quality Enhancement Mechanism to, to give a similar uh, but equal um, evaluation if, if, they need, if, if institutions need so, to participate. So you're saying ministers shouldn't be putting kind of institutions in an invidious position, or you say you know, should they be making a decision collectively for the whole regime? Or I, I just wonder what you're... Yeah, I mean, I think we're all in between a rock and a hard place, yeah. to, to be totally frank, because um, we have a bill going through um, the House of Parliament, um, we have this pressure on institutions that, you know, we, we have a good system in Scotland, we <clears> want <throat> to be able to attract students from um, Scotland, the UK and, and, the, and the rest of the world, and I think we're, we're in an incredibly difficult uh, place, and, you know, I acknowledge that... Uh, ministers are too, but that, that doesn't make it right to um, go ahead and say, yes, on you go, um, sign up to TEF. As further to that, but have you got any indication at all that that's what ministers are doing? Because, because I've been led to believe that so 
this is going to be a decision for the universities to make if they, if they decide to opt in, not a decision for ministers to make to uh, enforce people to opt in. Well, I think is there is there sort of a, a gateway for the minister to indicate yes, Scottish institutions can participate if they choose, and then institutions will um, decide whether to sign up to the different um, stages of, of TEF. So I guess ultimately the minister could say um, no, we don't want this in Scotland. But I guess the minister and the Scottish government is, is under pressure from institutions who, um, for all the reasons that people have explained, feel that they need to be um, out there and competitive and, 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 and being able to compare um, the degrees and the education they offer with institutions in, in England. Are you saying the ministers should, shouldn't be allowing participation or sort of almost prevent them from making... That invidious choice. I'm just, I'm just slightly confused as to what, what well, you're actually advocating that, ministers do. I guess we're in a really difficult situation um, because, you know, do we want to allow this marketise, privatise, the pressure to increase fees to, um, to, to come in and to be enhanced in our institutions in Scotland? And um, that's, that's the decision that the minister um, and, I guess, this committee has, has to make. And I, I agree it's incredibly um, difficult. OK, thank you. Do you want to come in briefly? How feasible would it be to have uh, a standard, a quality standard that is equivocal in terms of uh, different parts of the UK use uh, different standards, but they were seen on an equivocal basis. For example, uh, when it comes to um, the measurement between hires and uh, A-levels and the baccalaureate, there is a way of making sure that nobody is disadvantaged uh, because they've done a different system. Is there any merit in having a look at a system that might, or would that just not work? It's, it's, it's not impossible, and um, we've actually, within University of Scotland, we've got a TEF working group, which you know is kind of following twin tracks. One, which is a more urgent track, just because of a timetable of the bill and the TEF, is, is influencing TEF, so that if institutions choose to go in, it doesn't um, perversely disadvantage them. The other is looking at, well, what, what could we do in Scotland that might build that sort of equivalence? Um, it's, it, it, it's not impossible, it's, it's not, neither is it easy, because as soon as you start to build in a kind of variegated judgment of quality into our enhancement-led approach, you start to change it. Um, it starts to be something that may you know, be more prone to, to, to competitive rather than collaborative behaviours. And um, So you need to think that through quite carefully. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's the other option. What, you know, the one, one route is to... to if institutions choose better not to participate in the TEF, if they think there's an advantage there, the other is, is um, to explore the space of whether there's something that we can do for Scotland um, that, that generates an equivalence, and, and both of those are, are being examined. But I suppose, if I may, I think that almost strikes to the heart of what our concerns are, or not even concerns, so I suppose our fundamental position is we are resigned to TEF happening, it will happen, we want to see the system protected in Scotland. But if you boil TEF right down to its very core, TEF is nothing more than a set of metrics that are not new, they're already recorded, they're already measured, they're already published, they're already made public, everyone can access them freely. TEF is a mechanism by which those can be packaged up and then it goes, sits alongside a reflective assessment on the part of the institution, trying to provide a bit of context to those. So actually, TEF is not radical. TEF is not giving you any substantive. You take the headline measures of retention, of widening access rates, of graduate destinations. None of them tell you anything substantive about the quality of teaching at that institution. I think that's almost what's most disappointing, that with TEF, there was actually an opportunity to do something genuinely radical and genuinely interesting that tries to substantively get to the root of what good teaching looks like actually in a classroom. That's what the ALEAR system does. Whenever the ALEAR system happens <clears> in Scottish institutions, you get a panel together, you have externals on that panel. They question students and lecturers and everyone else saying, you know, how are students genuinely involved in forming their own teaching and learning? What does that look like and what are the outcomes that are created? But as I say, TEF at the end of the day is a set of metrics and an attempt to explain those metrics through a contextual statement. That is almost what happens with the existing system in Scotland, only the existing system in Scotland goes much, much further in terms of trying to really critically and really reflectively question those metrics and question what happens in a classroom. There should be absolutely no reason why the existing system cannot work within TEF. Um, and again, I think that's what's been most disappointing, that TEF 
by some is almost being seen as something new and big that will divert attention and energy and everything else away from what currently happens. And that is the thing that we absolutely must warn against. That the system as it is right now, you can take what you do right now in terms of the Scottish quality framework and actually just simply repackage it and submit it as TEF. It really wouldn't be that difficult to do. So I think we really need to be very careful about seeing TEF as something actually that starts to divert huge amounts of energy and attention away, because the worry is that it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that allows that to happen. Thank you. Colin, did you want to come in? One point I wanted to clarify. Um, Mary Senior referred earlier on to the University of Trump. And I see there's reference in the, the bill to deregulation of higher education corporations. What are the implications of that? Well, as I said, the bill does allow for private providers. Um, I mean, this is an aspect of the bill that, as I understand it, will apply in England. So at the moment, it wouldn't apply mm. in Scotland. And, you know, that's, I suppose, you know, quite clear. But, yeah, it's deeply worrying. Sorry. At the minute, you can only receive public funding in Scotland if you are a fundable body, i.e. one that receives their funding through the SFC. What will happen in Scotland is that public funding mainly tuition fee loans, but also some student support element for that student suddenly becomes available if you're a private provider. Again, provided we protect that very protected list of what constitutes a fundable body in Scotland, we can obviously um, ward off any enroachment of the private sector and those kinds of institutions um, into Scotland. Okay. Yeah, I think there's, um, there's, a, there's a reputational issue here, I think, for the United Kingdom, I mean, particularly as we look to, to, to Brexit and beyond. I mean, one of the huge brand advantages that the United Kingdom has is the integrity of the reputation of our universities. Um, and you don't get to be a university um, and call yourself a university unless you've jumped over some pretty high hurdles. You know, whether you're a new provider or an existing provider, you have had to really prove that you've got academic integrity um, before you get the title and before you get the right to award degrees. And I think, you know, albeit it doesn't directly apply in Scotland, I, I do have a worry about the um, diminution of the UK brand and the effect that would have on um, Scottish universities if um, institutions are not given an appropriately high hurdle to jump over before they can call themselves universities and offer degrees. I mean, to give you an example, I mean, India has, you know, a number of absolutely world-class universities compete with, you know, compete with the best anywhere. But um, there are also many, many um, institutions that, 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 that shouldn't be calling themselves universities in, in, uh, in countries that don't have a really tight regulation of, of, of university title. They just don't have an equivalent to what we call a university. And I think if Britain allows the brand to be um, diminished, um, then I think we lose a huge competitive advantage internationally as we look towards an uncertain world. How best can Scotland defend its reputation in this? Colin, can I, can I just come in a bit, Mark? Thank Sorry. you very much. The, uh, can I just ask then, does that mean that you're suggesting that it might be a disadvantage for some of the Scottish universities to be part of TEF if the British brand is being diminished as it is, as long as we can still highlight the Scottish Equality. I don't think it relates directly to, to TEF, really. I think it really re relates to the provisions in the bill that would enable the Office for Students to set um, lower tests than are currently set by the Privy Council as to whether you can call yourself a university yeah. and whether you can award degrees. So, sorry, I clearly I, I never made myself clear enough then, but part of the, the, the whole process is this uh, gold standard, etc. Mm -hmm. And if the British brand is being diminished, then that gold standard or silver standard, whatever, is starting to mean less than it would have beforehand. Would that mean then that Scottish universities would be better to try and have their own Scottish quality recognised internationally, and that would be in the long term better for Scottish universities? I think they'll have to make that judgment as, as the TEF evolves. I mean, if, if attaining high levels in the TEF are in some form recognised as, 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 as being um, a sign that you're actually an institution that's taking students seriously and, and doing things well, fine. Um, if over time, um, and, and, and with new entrants coming into the market, you're seeing some um, providers that, that, that actually don't meet the standards of academic integrity you, you would normally expect um, attaining high grades in the TEF, then you would question whether a system is in fact doing what it sets out to do and whether it's one you, you want to continue per to, to participate in. 
Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, Colin, you want to come back in? No, I mean, the question I was, asked, was just asking was one you broadly answered, which was how, how do Scottish universities defend themselves if there is a deterioration in the, the quality of the provision down south? Um, I think we um, have to make sure that, as well as the UK brand being perceived, um, the distinctiveness of the Scottish brand is being perceived. It does get international recognition. Um, we work closely with a number of institutions, in, including um, British Council, Royal Society of Edinburgh, Scottish Development International, um, on, and Scottish Government on the Connected Scotland initiative, which is about making sure we've got coherent brand propositions and making sure that we're targeting markets where um, there is growth potential for um, Scottish higher education's collaborations with, with, with international partners. So we need to, to, to build on that. And I think fundamentally the integrity of our institutions. I mean, if, if we are continuing to provide um, a world-class uh, higher education, um, we need to keep, keep saying that and keep proclaiming the distinctiveness and also the distinctiveness of the welcome that we can give in Scotland to, to people from around the world in, in, in these very uncertain times. Um, I think I'm a, a, a bit more relaxed about it, however, because I think that it's not in the UK's interest, it's not in England's interest to see a decrease in their standards. Why would it be? They, they're proud of their standards as well, so just as we are. So I would, you know, I, I think there will be enough checks and balances in place, but we have to safeguard Scotland. I quite I, I accept and readily agree with that. <coughs> but I don't think there's any indication that south of the border wishes to decrease their standards either. Thank you very much. In that case, can I thank the panel for their evidence this morning? And we'll take a short break before the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you.
The third item of business is the second of four sessions on the committee's pre-budget scrutiny. We hear from Skills, Development, heard from Skills Development Scotland last week and later this month we will be looking at the Scottish Qualifications Agency and Education Scotland. Today we are looking at the Scottish Funding Council and I welcome to the meeting Dr John Kemp, Interim Chief Executive, Dr Stuart Fancy, Director of Research and Innovation and Lorna Macdonald, Director of Finance, Scottish Funding Council. Before we start, I would like to put on the record the committee's thanks for the SFE arranging a visit for Liz Smith and Colin Beattie last week. And I understand Dr. John, Dr. Kemp wishes to make a short opening statement. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to meet with you today. Um, the Scottish Funding Council is the national strategic body for the funding of further and higher education in Scotland. We fund support and care for 25 colleges, 19 universities, 470,000 students across those colleges and universities, and nearly 50,000 full-time equivalent staff. And we spend a total budget of around 1.6 billion. Our ambition is that Scotland will be the best place in the world to educate, to learn, to research, to innovate, and that colleges and universities make a major contribution um, to Scotland's social, cultural and economic development. Our task is to care for and develop the whole system of colleges and universities and their connections um, to Scotland, uh, connections and contribution to Scotland's educational, social and cultural life. In our written submission, um, we've provided a summary of progress, and we think across a broad range of measures, um, our colleges and universities are doing well. But neither sector can stand still. There's been a great deal of change um, in the college sector in recent years. In future, there are shared aspirations for change in both sectors, on widening access, on developing the young workforce, on developing new learner journeys, and on implementing phase two of the Enterprise and Skills Review. So SFC looks forward to working with colleges, universities, government, and others on all of these issues. We also look forward to discussing these with you today and are quite happy to answer any of your questions, either on this or on the legislative consent motion you discussed earlier. Okay, thank you very much. We'll come to the LCM later on in the okay. session. But we'll, uh, have Joanne Lamont will start the questions. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for coming along and, and providing so much information. One of the things that comes out of the submissions to the committee is the extent to which people value the fact that you're um, distanced. You're at an arm's length from the Scottish Government. You're able to represent their voice. And indeed, you've just said that your job is to care for and develop colleges and universities. However, you also say that any advice you give to ministers you would give in privates. So in what set of circumstances would we know when you'd be concerned about Scottish Government policy or budget decisions? That's a tricky question. Uh, of course, when, when we speak to ministers, uh, we, do, we do speak in private, because I mean, that is the, you know, the correct way um, to give advice. However, um, I think, you know, from looking at the work of the Funding Council across a whole broad range of things, it's fairly clear what our view is on many things and, you know, and how that intersects um, with government policy. So while we, when, when we are meeting um, with ministers to advise them, sometimes the sectors are there with us. Um, and a good example of that is, is on the, the discussions um, round about the spending review, where we, with the higher education sector and the college sector and meeting with government um, and giving that advice with um, you know, our stakeholders present. Um, I think what we mean by that statement, um, I think we put in our submission that we, we generally give advice in private, is you know, when, when we write to ministers with advice it is given in private. So, if the Scottish Government is given advice from you, for example, that they were all advised to undertake the regionalisation of college boards and cut budgets for part-time courses. Mm. You wouldn't say that in public and we wouldn't know what your view was. Yeah. On, well, I have to say, on both of those issues, um, and particularly on regionalisation, that is one where we very much co-developed the policy with the government and putting learners at the centre was a, a policy document where we worked very closely with the government and the sectors on producing that. Um, and. You know, and then implementing it. So that's certainly one where you know, we were in exactly the same place as the government. And I think you know, that is how our relationship with government works. Our advice feeds into the policy documents, and which then feeds into to what we implement. On, on the prioritisation of full-time courses, that was one where, again, um, the government and the funding council were working quite closely 
um, together on that. And that was part of our response um, to the economic downturn in 2008-9, and looking very closely at how we responded to what at that time was a, you know, a very sharp increase in demand for full-time places for young people from colleges. Um, so th that is one where, um, as, as with regionalisation, we were working very closely with government. So we can work on the assumption, if you agree with them, we'll know, <laughs> because you'll say so. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I would certainly, we could have an argument that would last all day about how you deal with economic downturn by disadvantaging people in part-time courses, but that's a separate matter. But what you're saying is where you're agreeing with, and we're quite happy to say publicly you're working on things together, our difficulty in scrutinising the budgets is we don't know when you don't agree. And therefore, how do we know that actually the advice from the sector, which is, you know, and with things that we don't know about, because mm -hmm. you're not going to tell us, yeah. how can we possibly take a view and whether you think the budget has been given to you to do your job is sufficient, mm -hmm. or have you become, is there a danger that at one level you've simply been an organisation which is a distributor of funds on behalf yeah. of government, and the bit that presumably yeah. the institutions welcome, which mm -hmm. is the distance from government, is blurred, and we'll presumably come on later to some of the proposals and how that might be blurred yeah. further? Yeah, I... I think the view of, of the sectors is that we are much more than just a distributor of funds from, from government um, because they, they are often, as I said, with us on, on the discussions on things like the spending view, the very issue you raised. But just to make the point, we're not there. Right. So mm -hmm. the Parliament's not there, the people of yeah. Scotland are not there. Yeah. You are having a conversation with the government about budgets yeah. and presumably if the outcome is something you're not happy with, you're not going to say so. Yeah. Um, we, we are here. Ask us. Um, your, our views on the, the budget are, are what we're here for this morning. We are we're perfectly happy to answer any questions um, on our views on the budget. So if I were to ask you what your advice would be to the Scottish Government on merging this, the Funding Council with other bodies through the, the, institute, the Enterprise Review, you would be able to tell us what you think? In that case, um, our... Our, our input to the review has been made public. Um, there was um, an open um, call for evidence as part of phase one of the review. Um, in our submission, we, we highlighted several things um, that you know, were about coordination and were about closer working on, on innovation and on um, you know, aspects of the, you know, the skills system. Um, and you know, we, we've been quite public in our view that um, we, we are looking forward enthusiastically to working on phase two of the review and um, a lot of detail still to be worked out in there um, but we've you know i think we've made the point both in my submission today and in our submission um to the, the committee previously of the value we see in a body like the scottish funding council and university of scotland however says um, the SFC, sfc should have the capacity and confidence to initiate policy itself this is the aspect of SFC's role that has diminished in the recent years. First of all, would you agree with that? And secondly, would it be helpful if the Scottish Government were to say the self-denying ordinance of being private in your advice to government? Actually, it would help them if we were to see that that challenge and debate is at the heart of government? I think some of the ways that policy has been developed in recent years have involved the government, the sectors and the funding council working together rather than you know, separately coming up with solutions and then you know, choosing one of them. And, and, and actually, I, I think that is a good way of developing policy. Um, the, the issue of whether um, our advice to government um, you know, should routinely be made public. As I said, on some things it is. We, we respond to public consultations and so on, um, you know, and, and, that, and our views are quite well known there. Um, I think that would change the nature of the advice to government, and I think it would reduce the value of a body like ours if we, if we, you know, we are um, both working with the sector and with government and with other bodies. And I think if we were to go too far one way or the other, it would reduce our value. You will appreciate that um, when the Scottish Government comes out and says the Funding Council agrees with us, that strengthens the position, but there will not be a set of circumstances where we can say but the Scottish Funding Council doesn't agree with the Scottish Government. And therefore it doesn't open up some of the challenging debates that perhaps it should be broadened out from a, yeah. a direct... Mm -hmm. you know, face to face with yourself and the government. Yeah, I accept that. There, be, there are there is a balance to be struck um, on you know, the, the transparency of our advice to government. I would contend that on most things, it's fairly clear what our view is. 
Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Liz? Dr Kemp, you've offered this morning to be very direct in answering questions that the Parliament and this committee might put to you. Mm -hmm. uh, could I ask you about phase two of the proposed mergers with the Enterprise Bourne Schools Development Scotland? Are you in agreement with University Scotland when they raise concerns that the role of the Scottish Funding Council would put you in an increasingly political role that would be chaired uh, by a minister? I think there is a lot of detail to be worked through in phase two, um, and I think University of Scotland in their submission have highlighted many of the issues that will need to be addressed in phase two um, in coming up with a, a structure that is you know, appropriately transparent and also focused on the very broad range of things that um, you know, a, a single board would have to do. So we, we look forward to working with the government and others on phase two, and we would I acknowledge need to address many of the issues that University of Scotland... So, sorry, can I just ask you, are, are you concerned that the role of the Scottish Funding Council in a merged body might be more political? I, I, I think most of... I'm not necessarily concerned. Well, we'd have to see what the nature of that body was and, and who the members are, were and so on. But we already are a body that is created as an NDPB. We have a letter of guidance from government. We work very closely with government. And that, I wouldn't necessarily see that changing um, you know, if that board was very similar, say, in its, its nature to our board. I think there are a set of issues about how, um, as um, University of Scotland have highlighted about how you, you deal with the board that is so diverse and you know, might be focused on, on enterprise and skills uh, as opposed to the, the wide range of things to do with the south of Scotland the highlands and research and widening access. There was an interesting comment uh, made when uh, Colin Beattie and I had the privilege to come to Queen Margaret University last week that uh, the Scottish Funding Council was really uh, a little bit removed from government but not terribly far. Is that a view that you are comfortable with, that you are increasingly political in the role that you have? And just to add the points that Joanne Lamont has correctly asked you in terms of the scrutiny, yeah. um, this parliament and this committee has to scrutinise the work that you do. And if we go back to the Audit Scotland uh, report recently, they um, were reasonably comfortable with what's happening on the short term, but on the long term strategy, they had lots of questions and felt that there wasn't uh, transparency and that there wasn't sufficient uh, scrutiny of that. Yeah. Are you entirely comfortable with the way that the Scottish Funding Council is running just now? Um, yes. Um, I, I, we spend £1.6 billion pounds worth of public money um, on colleges and universities, um, and it is right that we reflect the will of Parliament and the government in um, the spending of that money. And you know, we, we receive a letter of guidance from government. And we are there um, both to make sure, as, as I said earlier, to care for the system of colleges and universities, so, but also to make sure that they're delivering what that £1.6 billion pounds worth of public funding. Do, do you dismiss the concerns then of Audit Scotland when they uh, recognise that there is a lack of transparency on the longer term overarching strategy and therefore our ability to scrutinise that is, is somewhat compromised? Yeah. I, I was reflecting on the way into um, the committee this morning that between summer and Christmas, um, with committee appearances that have already happened, including today's and some that are happening tomorrow and between Christmas, I'll have, I'll have appeared at seven committees. So I think that the level of scrutiny um, of, of, of SFC, I think, is, you know, is fairly clear. We are, we, are, we are open and transparent and available for scrutiny by Parliament. Um, the, long, the, the, the issue about the, the longer term strategy and Audit Scotland, could you, was that on which issue? Their concern is, uh, in the, in the uh, more recent report, that when it comes to uh, the way that yeah. you're asked to implement Scottish Government uh, policy alongside the institutions, yeah. Yeah. when it comes to outcome agreements, mm -hmm. they were relatively comfortable. But yeah. when it came to the longer perspective mm -hmm. of what they, the, the yeah. process involved, yeah. Yeah. they felt there was a lack of transparency and they felt that because of that, it was more difficult for uh, us to scrutinise it. And I think that's a fair point that they make. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's that, I think, that if you combine what Joanne Lamont is asking this morning, what I'm mm -hmm. asking now, mm -hmm. um, that is an issue that uh, raises a question mark. Yeah. I, th I think we are perfectly happy with any level of transparency. And if you know, there are you know, detailed things we can do 
to make our work more transparent, we're quite happy to work with this committee or any other to do that. Could, it, could I just ask about um, a comment that's made by University of Scotland where they say that policy teams that might have previously had the capacity to concentrate on widening access or knowledge exchange policy have found themselves increasingly stretched after an organisational restructure to focus time on outcome agreements process. Yeah. Is that yeah. accurate? Um, the, the staff of the Scottish Funding Council has been reducing in recent years. I mean, there has been very tight public um, spending climate. Um, so our staff have been going down. And at the same time, we have been focusing um, on outcome agreements, which was quite a major change for our organisation a few years ago. However, I would, I would push back slightly on um, University of Scotland's point in that while we no longer have we used to have large policy teams that did um, things like widening access, skills and research and so on. We now have people who work as outcome agreement managers, but also sometimes are part of an access team and so on. And we think that's um, a useful way of using their skills so that they both have an outward focusing um, experience of what's going on in institutions, but also you know, have some policy expertise. We need to constantly think about the balance of that. Um, and we have been um, in that when outcome agreements were new, the teams were, were expanded quite a bit because you know, they took a bit of bedding down. As time goes on, that balance is changing. But I, th I accept the point made by University of Scotland that there has been a change in the focus on the staff and the funding council. If it's true that uh, your staffing has been reduced, then yeah. by definition, those existing members must be doing more work, particularly given the uh, extent of the work that is required in the yeah. G and FE sectors just now. Yeah. Does different that diminish? Work as, different work as well. I mean, the, 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 the sectors have changed quite a bit. We've been changing funding methods, you know, so we haven't been staying still. D does that mean, in any sense, that there, uh, that the casework for the people who? Uh, remain is increased and therefore would that have any implications for the quality of the work that they can do simply because they haven't got so much yeah. time? Yeah, um, I, I, we wouldn't overload people to the extent that it you know, affected quality. It's important that we do work um, to a very high standard. Um, University of Scotland's point, though, that our policy teams are not as large as they used to be, and that's often people who are doing you know, a, a, a mixed task of outcome agreements plus um, policy work. One of the ways we're addressing that, and, and it's with University of Scotland, on things like the implementation of the Commission for Widening Access work, we are working very closely with University of Scotland on that. And I, I think that's a good way of ensuring that we are very close to the sectors and how you might implement these things. Um, it's a different way of working, but I, I think there is pressure on all parts of the public sector to operate you know, more efficiently and to get better outcomes by working you know, more collaboratively with others. Mm. My, my, final point, sorry, my final point would be that obviously if, if there are fewer people in policy teams and fewer mm. policy developments and yeah. advisory role that yeah. uh, is so important that the Scottish Funding Council has uh, with the Scottish Government, are you entirely comfortable that your advisory role is as, eff as effective as it used to be? I, yes, um, and, and if, if you look at the what's been the major changes that have been in the college sector recently, that has been very much the funding council working very closely with government and, and in an advisory role. And if you think of some of the challenges that are, that are coming up um, on things like the learner journey, where you know, the government has you know, set out an aspiration to change that, we will be very much part of advising the government on how to do that with um, partners in other parts of the world and schools and in other organisations too. But I don't think we have in any way diminished our capacity to, to participate in that kind of policy change. Thank you very much, Tavish. I continue to ask a, a couple of questions about this theme of, of um, an NDP being independent of government or, or, mm -hmm. or being simply an arm of government. Um, my reading of the 8th of... Um, February letter, guidance letter, that you've mentioned the letters of guidance from ministers, Dr. Kemp, the 8th of uh, February guidance letter is there are 55 paragraphs in that letter and they are prescriptive by any standards. Mm -hmm. um, and I see in the RSC submission to this committee today, that's one of their concerns. Would you accept that's changed quite a lot in recent years? That you're, you, I don't mean you personally, but the yeah. organisation's under much more direct prescriptive direction from ministers? 
I'm trying to. I've, I've been at the funding council for about 15 years, and I'm exactly. trying to trying to remember the length of um, guidance letters over those years, um, and they have varied up and down, um, and it's often depended on the style of the minister, um, and that's covered you know, several administrations over that time. Um, that I, I'm not sure there is a direct relationship between the length of the letter and the prescriptiveness um, of, the, of, of the government. Um, I would contend, though, that you know, 55 paragraphs for £1.6 billion is, you know, is, is reasonable. Um, you can be very prescriptive within that, or you can be less prescriptive. But um, I, I, I haven't perceived a huge change in the pres prescriptiveness of governments. And I'd, I'd say I've been at the Funding Council for about 16 years, and, the, and that's covered quite a few ministers and quite a few governments. They have all had aspirations um, you know, for change in colleges and universities, and they've all expressed that through, through guidance letters. So on the, uh, the, 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 the letter of the 23rd of March, which has a section on widening access, simply because you raised that, mm -hmm. I happen to have it uh, yeah. on the screen in front of me, in that there is a sentence, and I'm just choosing this for example, where the minister says, I want to see no diminution in efforts to widen access. Yes. That, by any standards, is a very clear ministerial intent. Now, you go through that whole 50, all 55 paragraphs, yeah. apologise, and you find that kind of language. You've got no room for manoeuvre there at all as an organisation. You're being told exactly what to do, aren't you? I, but that is something that, um, you know, if you to, to pose a counterfactual, imagine a funding council that did want to diminish its um, uh, efforts to widen access, I, you know, I, clearly against what I perceive as the wishes of pretty much every party in the parliament um, and the government, um, I think you would be asking questions about, you know, we, we voted you £1.6 billion, pounds, you've chosen not to carry forward, you know, something that is... Uh, an agreed policy of all the parties in the but parliament. But to take Joanne Lamont's question, yeah. uh, many of us disagreed with changing the yeah. the, uh, the relationship and yeah. college yeah. funding so that there were less part-time uh, courses and less women able to take college courses. So actually there wasn't political agreement there. Yeah. But again, I, could, I can't find it right now, and you'll yeah. forgive me. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I could find a bit there where, yeah. again, the minister's saying, if I may say so, get on with it. Yeah, yeah. So and there it, wasn't agreement on that one. Yeah. No, no, and... and uh, and on that one, I just think where there was agreement was between the funding council and the government on that. That was one where we had been advising them at the you know, way back in 2008-9 that you know there were a lot of very short courses yes. that didn't lead to recognised qualifications that we felt could be deprioritised in order to have more part time. I'm trying to think of an example of where we have been you know, directly told to do something that you know we didn't perceived would be you know, the will of the parliament, or, or it was actually quite closely related to our strategic plan or our council's aims as well. I'm not really arguing, yeah, I'm yeah, not in that yeah, sense yeah. trying to yeah. pick that kind of hole, Dr yeah. Kemp, I'm just saying that yeah. I think the line of questioning is more, is more that it yeah. strikes some of us that there's much more yeah. direction now. Can I just take one other example, yeah. and it's very, it's, it's because Colin Beattie and I spent an inordinate amount of time this on in the audit committee last time round. Yeah. In the submission to, um, again to the committee from the Auditor General, um, she says under college go governance, you'll understand why I ask all this yes, given indeed. previous uh, yeah. subjects, um, the S and I quote, the SFC's role in regulating college governance is not clear. Yeah. It's quite a, uh, why I suppose is the obvious answer. Yeah. Um, Question. Right? Well, I mean, the, that, that would be a question you know, for the Auditor General, but I mean, what I perceive um, her to mean is that, um, and I, I did follow up with the Auditor General staff when they were writing the report, um, was that you know, some of the you know, failings that there were in college governance over the last couple of years, it hadn't been clear exactly what our role was as opposed to others and how we should have been handling that. Um, in, since the events at you know, Coke Bridge and um, North Glasgow, you know, there has been a, a good governance group um, established by the government. We, we have been working with other stakeholders on clarifying that role. And I would hope that, you know, as that is worked through, that role will become clearer. Um, but there, you know, it's a, it, there are aspects um, of college governance that are very properly um, with the board of colleges as charities. Yeah, there absolutely. are bits that rely on government powers and there are bits that are our responsibility. We need to be absolutely clear on that. And can I therefore just f finish the loop, which yeah. takes me right back to, I think, Joanne Lamont's very first question or one of her questions. Um, isn't the logic, therefore, uh, haven't you just absolutely made the case why 
uh, an SFC board with responsibility, for example, for college governance, is the right way for the future because that kind of issue would never get the attention at one of the, at this super board that's going to be in charge of everything yeah. all these organisations yeah. do. Well, I, I think that is well, and actually, the, the Auditor General's um, um, report did refer yeah. to you know, dealing with that as part of the enterprise and skills review, and that that is very much one of the things yeah. that needs to be looked at in phase two is how you retain the capacity to have a, an organisation that is dealing with those issues within that new structure. Thank Thank you. Colin, you're a short supplementary then, Richard. Well, not so much supplementary. I had a question. I'll come back to later then, because okay. we've got you for the next session. Richard. Yeah, th thank you. Mm -hmm. It strikes me political parties spend a lot of time calling on ministers to intervene in terms mm -hmm. of further and higher education funding decisions, uh, and therefore it's an intriguing debate that uh, the funding council is too close to government. Mm -hmm. However, can I ask, in light of that theme, how your model compares with models in other countries in terms of how close or not you are to government? Um, well, the most immediate um, parallel is, is with England, where I mean, there, there used to be a funding council, uh, well, there still is, um, but it, you were talking earlier about the legislation which you know, changes Hefke into something very different, um, an office for students and separates off um, the... You know, the research parts of it. The, the, it's, it's very hard to compare because further and higher education systems vary a lot around the world. We are quite unusual in that we fund both further and higher education and I think that is a huge benefit that we think of it as one post-16 system um, and fund both bits of it. Um, in terms of relationships with government, because we do, we do spend quite a lot of money on further and higher education. In other parts of the world, a lot of that is coming from fees and from other sources, um, so there isn't the, the same um, type of, of body as us. Um, funnily enough, the, 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 the parallel that you know, the, the funding council will perhaps speak to most, because it's most like us, is as far away as New Zealand. Um, <laughs> But I'm not, to be honest, I couldn't tell you how interventionist their government is compared to ours. Um, but it's very hard to compare because the, the systems for funding further and higher education are so different. And therefore, you know, the, 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 ex the extent to which you'd expect government um, uh, interference are vary quite a bit. And England is moving in a completely different direction. My question is really about retention and two different types of retention. Retention of quality staff and retention of students. So if I can deal with staff, first of all, um, and you'll know my background that I was both a staff member of a college and then I became an agency uh, lecturer as well. So I'm really coming from that experience. Is there any monitoring of the level of agency lecturers against those with permanent contracts and the impact that that has on the quality of teaching. Now, I'm not saying that from the point yeah. of view of agency staff being lesser calls. What I'm saying yeah. is that the retention of yeah. those people with those contracts, yeah. Yeah. They given that permanence, yeah. is, that a, is that something that you monitor? We don't collect the data on whether staff or agency staff um, or, or full-time or permanent staff, and, and we don't relate that to quality. Um, now, when Education Scotland are doing reviews, I'm, I'm not aware that they would monitor that either. Um, but it's something we could look at. I mean, it, 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 we are... The data on staff in colleges is not, is not as extensive or hasn't been in the past as it has been in universities, and that's one of the areas for equalities reasons and so on we are keen to improve. So that's one of the things we could look at. Yeah, um, I'll tell you where I'm coming from in that. Yeah. In terms of um, quality of teaching, you could have a situation, um, certainly I have seen this in my experience, the 15 years that I spent at college, where you have excellent people coming in to work in a college from industry, yeah. who um, then leave and we don't know why, and they're never, they're never given any kind of like exit interview as to yeah. what it was that's made them yeah. move on. And yeah. that doesn't, um, yeah. so I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're saying that you would look at that because yeah. I think that yeah. is a real issue, particularly given that we are going to have more stronger links with industry yeah. as well. And we're asking those people to come from industry and teach in our colleges. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and we would want people with industry experience and recent industry experience to be working in colleges. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes a revolving door is a way of doing that, but you want 
want to know it's revolving for the right reasons. You want to know it's revolving for the right reasons, yes. exactly. Yes. And, and, and one other yes. thing as well, that I, <laughs> since you're taking notes on my, my wish list here, um, <laughs> um, those, those people coming from industry who have got an awful lot to offer colleges, yeah. um, they could be instrumental in keeping those courses relevant and doing development work. Yeah. But because mm. they're working for an agency, they don't have those staff contracts. They're not given the, the paid right. time to do that. Yeah. So, so, sorry, I'm just maybe on my hobby horse here. <laughs> the other, the, the other yeah. issue um, that I want to speak to you about is student retention yeah. and how that's monitored. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that students, uh, that colleges are funded if students are retained up until a certain point in the academic year. Could you explain that for yeah. us? Yeah. Well, but I'll perhaps let my colleague um, Lorna come in later. Yes, but the, the, we, we fund, um, a, there's a, a date in round about November um, that, where it, if the student stays beyond that, you know, they get more funding. Um, but w the way that we, we monitor retention and success rates is we, we look at the whole range of, you know, how many stayed until the, the early retention date, how many stayed till the end of the course, and how many were successful as well. So we look at the whole range. Do you want to say anything more on that, Lorna? Um, I think you've actually covered it, John, if that's all right. <laughs> so the impact of having that date, um, something that the NUS have spoken to me about, is that the impact of having that date is that beyond that date, they have made criticisms that yeah. students haven't been given the this, this support that's allowed them to retain them because it doesn't have an impact yeah. on funding. How would you answer that criticism? Um, the... We, we focus on, for funding purposes, we do have that cut-off date because some, there, there does tend to be a drop-off and we need to sort of make sure we're only funding students that were there. But what we would want and what we focus on through the outcome agreements and the performance indicators is success by getting to the end of the course and passing it. So we, don't, we certainly don't ignore, you know, once you've got to that date, that our performance indicator isn't that you stay for... 25% of the course. Performance indicators, you stay till the end and are successful. So that's what we focus on in the outcome agreements. And are you, it's what you're suggesting that the, the funding method might incentivise colleges to be more concerned about the early part than the latter part. I think it's more about coming... For, so I was speaking to NUS and, and they were saying that because there is this drop-off level in retention, yeah. Um, yeah. and obviously student retention is really, really important and it's yeah. really important to identify why it is that students are, are, are dropping off, mm -hmm. that is there a correlation perhaps between how the funding model works and the, the, the yeah. effort to retain students and to look into the reasons why students might yeah. be in difficulty. And yeah, I, I think that might have been... A, Certainly 10 years ago, um, when there was less focus on the performance indicators and before outcome agreements, there was the funding played a bigger part in what happened than are looking at the outcomes. Um, and I, you, I, I was aware of you know, issues then about you know, colleges being more concerned about the earlier part so that mm -hmm. they got over the funding hurdle. I, w I would think that's probably less true now because there is so much focus. Um, on the you know, the end point on and the the, you know, getting the success rate, and you know the success rates have been going up, with the exception of you know the full time FE one dipped a bit last year, um, but the, the overall trend has been that they are going up. So that leads me on to my next question, supplementary question to that. In terms of measuring the destinations of students, yeah. either destinations where they've maybe come out of the course early. Yeah. Yeah. sometimes for very legitimate reasons, maybe yeah. other opportunities. How are they being measured? Because that seems to be that the, the, there is the stats there about retention, yeah. which are not really dug into as to where the destination yeah. is if people have left the course yeah. early. Well, we do have a, a destination survey now that, that tracks where students um, go to after their course. I would accept that the students, and, and, and that covers, I think it's about... 85 to 90 percent of students are tracked, um, but the ones that are, we don't track are probably more likely to be the ones that have dropped out early because they're harder to find. They, they've not gone on to other courses. That's one that we, we need to keep on working to make sure that we've got um, the data on the students who dropped out early as well as the ones who've completed the course. Um, because there are... It, 
it's very hard to, to fathom sometimes why students have dropped out. Sometimes it's just the wrong course. Other times that you know, they wanted a job, they've got a job halfway through the course, so they'll leave. But we need to know, you know the detail of that so that you know, the college... Because if, if people can get a job halfway through a course, then the course is too long. <laughs> you know, they, they, we should be running a different kind of course that gets them to where they want to go quicker. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you absolutely get that these, this is really important oh, information absolutely. to have in yes. how you structure Indeed. your courses. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Uh, Ross, you do supplement. On the note of, of um, student dropouts, I don't like to talk about students dropping out in purely financial terms, but as we're doing pre-budget scrutiny, uh, there does seem to be an issue there of uh, money being spent on students who then drop out, not representing good value at all, because not enough is being spent on the student support to keep them in. Now, longer term, looking at reform of student support, what's needed in the short term, though, to prevent that money essentially becoming wasted? Because there does seem to be a big issue with the discretionary support budgets. The what we've been trying to... There have been issues in the past, um, we've had reported from colleges, that um, you know, the availability of the, the, the FE bursary and has been part of, and, and the discretionary support and so on, has been part of the reason that they've perceived that students have dropped out. Um, in recent years, we've tried to focus that funding on need better, because one of the issues is... Um, if, in, in allocating places to a college, it's relatively stable. You know roughly how many you know they will need and you know, how much they can use. Student support is far more volatile. If you've got a different body of students, different ages, um, and, and different genders, and so on, that, that can really affect the student support budget. So it's far more harder to predict. Um, so in, in la I think last year, for the first time, we we used an, a need-based analysis, which I think will reduce the need for an in-year redistribution, uh, which we do every year as well. Um, and, because that had been quite a sticky method of getting the, the, the funding in the right place. But it's it's the kind of thing that will be looked at in the student support review that's you know, just kicking off as well. Um, but we do recognise it is one of the potential um, you know, reasons for dropout is uncertainty about student support. OK, thank you very much. Colin? Thank you, Vera. Um, firstly, thank you for accommodating us last week at uh, Liz and myself uh, on the visit to Kumagi University, and thank you for providing this helpful uh, document on depreciation, which I'm sure we've all been uh, studying. It was actually quite interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I realise it's uh, professional accounting practice that... Uh, that dictates this, but my, my con there's a couple of concerns here and a little bit of information I need. Obviously, it means that most colleges are going to end up with a technical deficit, no matter what they do. Firstly, is that deficit year on year or is it accumulative? In other words, will it get worse yeah. in terms of the impact it has on the apparent bottom line? Yeah. I think this is one where I will bring in my director of finance. It's, it's not it's not cumulative, um, but you're absolutely right. Technical deficits are what we're what we should be expecting, and you'll see from the Audit Scotland report in fo in fourteen fifteen the results. Um, the overall deficit was twenty eight point three million, and with the adjustments for non cash aspects and one offs. The overall deficit was underlying was a three million position, um, and in in the number of colleges that showed a deficit at that time, technical deficit as well as as other potential deficits, there was about fifteen colleges in that category. So this is the norm. It's not something that's going to get worse and worse. The priorities for the use of depreciation have been set, um, and in many cases, you know, any revenue spend on that depreciation category, that, that non-cash um, budget, um, the priorities of student support and um, also pay um, pressures, those, would, those will continue. But you can't keep allocating additional priorities to that, that, that amount of money. Mm. I mean, obviously, from the point, budgetary point of view, this committee is interested in being able to look and readily see yeah. if a college is in deficit or not. And, uh, you know, members tend not to look at whether it's a technical deficit or whether it's a real deficit. How, how are we going to get this presented in such a way that committee members can readily see 
what the real financial position of the college is without having to go into the accounts and interpret. You, you're absolutely right, and, and you'll see from the note that we've actually um, added um, requirements within the accounts direction to make that communication much clearer. So understanding where it is a technical deficit and understanding where it's an underlying deficit is actually very important for everyone to understand. And just a small clarification, we talk about professional accounting practice. Is it the same professional accounting practice the whole, across the whole of the public sector? It's the recommended practice for further education and higher education institutions. Is that different from other yes, sectors? Yes. For instance, uh, other charities would have to apply a charity sort, but for colleges and universities, they have to apply the, the further education and higher education sort. And how does that significantly differ from how other public sector budgets are handled? Quite considerably um, different from the, the normal uh, government accounting accounts um, and indeed there's going to be a further change in the SORP which will make the interpretation of accounts, well quite sadly, um, more confusing going forward. But the communication of the underlying message is something that we have to improve on collectively going forward. Well, obviously it's a concern if we can't compare one area of the public sector with another. Would it be possible for you to um, encapsulate on one page <laughs> what the differences are, what the significant differences are, how, how, how when we look at the education budget, that it would differ if it was another, if, another area of the public sector, if I'm yes. making myself clearer. I, I'm happy to provide that after following this committee. I'll put that in writing. I think that would be quite important, actually. Now, in the paper you supplied, uh, under the heading of uh, priorities for spend of depreciation funds, you've already touched on uh, the, th the three areas which were prioritised, which is student support funds, loan repayments and costs of the 2015-16 pay, pay award. Now, that these are not necessarily one-off payments, are they? They are continuing obligations. Absolutely. So therefore, the flexibility with the, the, the net depreciation is actually reduced because the commitment actually goes, goes forward. That's an annual commitment that has to be met from that, that um, allocation. And are these guidelines laid down by the Scottish Government or the SFC? The priorities have been, that, that's ministerial approval for the priorities. Uh, and indeed, the loan repayments, that's a legal commitment um, for any loans that existed prior to April 2014. So we're relying on, on the accounting practice as we have to continue in order to be able to, in effect, fund these? Yes. Okay. Uh, perhaps just one other question arising from our discussion last week. Um, one of the areas that I did highlight was I was a wee bit concerned about the role of SFC as a regulator as opposed to a provider of funding to the colleges and universities. And I, th I got the impression there is still not a clear role there as to where the regulatory part lies and where the pure funding lies. Yeah. And you, you, you raised that last week, and I've been thinking of it since, um, and, and you know, whether there are benefits in being both or, 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 or separating them. And right, a regulator is, is responsible, often usually on behalf of the public, you know, for a, you know, ensuring a service is you know, high quality and um, efficient and you know, using money correctly. Um, and, and we do that. Um, on behalf of the public you know, in our regulatory role. And I think it's probably easier to do it um, while we fund as well, um, because of the relationship we have with the institutions. Um, we, we discharge our regulatory role in a number of ways through our quality work, some of which you, you heard talked about earlier today. Um, you know, and that is very much part of the ensuring that what happens in colleges and universities is of high quality and we do that through QEA and Education Scotland. We have other roles in governance as we've talked about earlier which is part of a regulatory role and we, we do that um, through you know, in, in the college sector through the, you know, the recommendations of the college governance task group. Um, would it be easier to do those if we were standing separately from the, the colleges and universities or, or from the funding? Um, 
I think it's, you know, it's probably a question not for us, but for the, the wider world. But I don't think it um, it would be because many of the the interactions we would have, you know, if if quality is not good, if there are governance issues, some of the ways that we can pr bring things back on track is through the work that we, the day to day work of our outcome ag agreement managers and others with colleges and universities, and through funding levers. I mean, that's one of the you know the levers we have. Now, that doesn't work for absolutely everything. Um, but it does work for some things. I mean, I'm not arguing for one yeah. model or another. Yeah. What I'm arguing for really is clarity yeah. as to where the two roles sit within yeah. S SFC and clarity as to how SFC see themselves as yeah. a regulator. Yeah. I mean, being responsible overall for the health of the sector yeah. and for ensuring that uh, whatever regulations, laws, guidelines and so on are made or enforced. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we, we should perhaps make that clearer um, you know, to yourselves and the world how the things I've talked about there fit together, about, about how our, our, our quality work is regulatory work as, and how that fits with the governance work and how that fits with the outcome agreements, which are you know, a way of ensuring that you know, what we think we're getting from colleges and universities is what we get. Very briefly, and then yeah, can I just further to Colin Beattie's um, budgetary points rather than his regulatory points. Again, the Audit Scotland say in the letter to us for today, the SFC does not currently prepare medium to long term budgets. Why not? We partly because we are funded year to year, yeah. um, you know, by by the government, um, and in 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 times currently the, the last. Um, budget settlement was a one-year one. The next one will be a one-year one. Um, but before that, we, you know, it was more common that there was you know, a, a longer time horizon. And in that, when when we have that certainty, we have we have had you know, medium and long-term um, planning. We also do um, consider. Well, I wouldn't want to contradict the Auditor General. We, Lorna does have a. You know, a huge amount of information about the rolling forward of budgets and what our strategy for the future would be. We've probably not expressed that in a way that the Auditor General has seen as a strategy, um, but yeah, it's something we do need to look at. Well, I suspect maybe if I could be so bold, the committee would really welcome that. Yeah, I, mean, I yeah, think what yeah. you're making is a really good point, and if you're doing your work anyway, yeah. if you wanted to share it in some sense with us, yeah. I think we would support yeah. that. Okay, good. If further to that, I mean the point that. Call, the clarification Colin was asking for, and you suggested might be a good idea. It might well be that you want to pull yeah. stuff together and okay. send it to the committee. Yeah. Yeah. Was one one point on a very related theme. Um, previous committees uh, have asked your predecessor uh, Lawrence Hills and then Mark Batho before him too about whether you feel there is sufficient data available to measure effectively whether the Scottish Funding Council is doing a good job. Do you believe that? there is sufficient data available to measure the quality of what the Scottish Funding Council is delivering, or are, are there other aspects of data that would be helpful? Um, it's always useful to have more data, and, 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 and in analysing the effectiveness of the Scottish Funding Council, often what we're doing is analysing you know, the effectiveness of what our funding has turned into in terms of widening access or, or research and so on. There is a huge amount of data there. Um, it's often how we use it and how we, um, how we promote that out to the world so that you can see the changes in, 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 in something like widening access. Often, um, it, the, if you could link data together in different ways so that you could, the point we talked about earlier about what happens to students after they leave yeah. college, you know, yeah. particularly if they've left early, we know that for 85% of the students, there's the other 15 we don't. A lot of it wouldn't be about developing new data, it would be making sure that our existing data sets are complete, um, that they are covering the right things and they're linked together so that we know, you know, when somebody leaves a college, where do they go? What what outcome does that have for them if they completed the course or if they didn't complete the course? Um, and so that's the kind of information that I think would be very useful for us to know if we're doing the right thing. Um, because it's often um, we have, you know, we take policy decisions based on the data we have, the world changes, you need to see how that looks in five years' time. So, 
something that might a student destination six months out or four years out might be very different from where they look in 10 years and so on. So I, I'm the kind of person who would always like more data, but I do realise that you know, there are limits. Thank you. Daniel? Uh, yes. So, I mean, just relating onto these points about yeah. uh, accounting measures, and, uh, and, yeah. and apologies if this is getting technical, but I mean, yeah. Colin Beattie was asking about comparisons across the public sector. And is it not fair to comment at this point that actually colleges and universities have a very different status with re that regard? Obviously, with universities being uh, yeah. charities yeah. and college, uh, colleges yeah. now finding themselves categorised yeah. as, 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 as uh, public sector institutions. Yeah. But also charities as well. Uh, so, yes, they, they, they are very different beasts. And however, in terms of accounting standards, again, I'll defer to my colleague Lorna on the difference in accounting standards between... I think I'll follow that up in, in a paper on the difference in accounting standards, but they are very much following. They have to follow a certain recommended practice for, for their um, yeah. operations. Yeah. Are you wanting to ask my main questions, Kavina? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, following on in terms of the points of, of uh, on colleges, I mean, obviously, colleges have probably seen the biggest changes within the, 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 the tertiary education sector. And I think it's with, you know, some concern to note both the comments in the Audit Scotland report through the summer, but also the comments that the Auditor General supplied to us before this meeting regarding uh, the measuring the, the benefits of yeah. that process. And, and, you know, to quote, they're saying that there's, you know, serious sorry, uh, issues in terms of fully measuring whether or not the merger programme has delivered all of the expected benefits. I'm just wondering kind of what your reflections and yeah. comments are, are yeah. on that point would be and whether or not we really will be able to determine yeah. whether or not the, 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 the benefits yeah. have been delivered and, 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 and whether it's been yeah. successful or not. Yeah, we, we published a, a report um, reflecting on our post-merger valuations. We've done post-merger valuations of all the mergers um, and we've done the two-year ones of all of them earlier this year, and we published a, a summary report. And that measured the progress against the stated aims of the mergers, um, you know, against their, their, their plan at the time. The Auditor General's um, point, and I think it's a valid one, is that there are other baselines that could have been used um, at the time, and then, you know, we could have tracked things forward. Um, there are some of the, the data um, that we have on things like college leaver destinations we simply didn't have at the time, so we couldn't have used as baselines. I take, I take the Auditor General's point, though, that perhaps some of the other things we should have been clearer in stating um, at the time what the aim was uh, on, on some of these measures. However, for the ones that did exist at the time and do exist now, um, we, we have tracked, and that was part of our post-merger evaluation, we've tracked on things like retention and success rates in colleges. Um, that was not explicitly set out as an aim of the mergers programme, but we have tracked the impact of um, the merger or or what we've, we've, when I say the impact of the merger programme, that's maybe overstating it because we don't know what's affected you know, your success rates over that time and it's not clear. But you know, we, we are able to track quite a lot of the baseline. So, yes, I mean, it, it comes back to the point about you know, more data would generally be good so you can me measure success. But quite a lot of it we have. It just wasn't explicitly stated um, as part of the merger programme. Because I, mean, I think the Auditor General is making much bolder point than that, saying that, that essentially the Scottish Funding Council and the Scottish Government have not publicly set out when the benefits of these college mergers will be achieved and how will they will measure them. I mean, yeah. I think specifically yeah. they're saying that there's incomplete baseline data. And, and I think yeah. the particular point here yeah. is also raised about the cost of harmonising staff pay, just not included in those cost assessments. And yeah. that, that yeah. sounds a, yeah. a bit more yeah. kind of central rather yeah. than marginal yeah. You know, in response to what you've when, just when, said. At the time the Auditor General published um, a report, um, we hadn't published the, the post-merger evaluation summary. When we published the post-merger evaluation summary, we didn't have all of the harmonisation data from the colleges. I'm pleased to say we now do have that, and the cost of the harmonisation of... Um, I'll come back to a caveat on this, but the, the cost of the harmonisation related to the mergers was about 6.2 million. Um, so you need to consider that against the, you know, the 52 million recurrent savings. The challenge in that harmonisation um, data, and this is the caveat, is that 
as national bargaining was coming in, some of the decisions about harmonisation and how you harmonised um, pay costs in the college sector were taken against that background as opposed to the merger. And it's quite hard to you know, disaggregate the two. But the total cost of the, the, the harmonisation was £6.2 million a year. Okay. So, I mean, just in terms of the success of our colleges, I, mean, I think their ability to invest is absolutely critical. I mean, you've highlighted yeah. that there's a, a, there's a, a well over £200 million pounds worth of investment you re needed to bring college estate up yeah. to standard. But at the same time, we've seen a 77% uh, reduction in capital investment available to colleges. I mean, yeah. what, what would your commentary be on, on, on that and the ability of colleges to, to move forward? And, and secondly, I mean, what's the impact been in, in terms of the reclassification as, as uh, public yeah. sector bodies? Um, well, as once they became public sector bodies, um, the ability to retain reserves and to borrow money to address capital projects became much more difficult. That you can retain some reserves through an arm's length trust, but that's again, you know, it's an arm's length and it's not really a reserve. Um, so yes, that that has um, changed the way in which colleges can address um, capital issues. Previously, they could, you know, in effect, save up and then you know, use that with subgrant from us um, to address capital issues. So the fact that they can't puts far more onus on the funding council and the government to be aware of their capital needs um, and to help them you know, address those. We are currently doing um, some estates needs work with colleges um, and we're expecting the outcome of that to be available in the next few weeks. And then we're going to be doing a larger piece of work on estates need over the next year or so, looking at all the colleges. Because we recognise that while some of the college sector in Scotland has a very good estate, there's been a lot of new buildings. The city of Glasgow opened a very large new building just a couple of weeks ago. Um, there are other bits you know, that are, are now coming up to the, the stage where they, they do need investment. So, so given that kind of kind of very large hurdle that's been placed to college. I mean, are you concerned by uh, recent reports yeah. that your board may be merged into the overarching board for enterprises and that that may be directly chaired by a minister? Now, would that, to your mind, potentially put universities' yeah. status at risk? Potentially, would they be liable to become classified as, as uh, public sector bodies? And, and what would that do to the, the 2.5 billion that universities currently hold in reserve and their ability to invest? The, the issue of universities being classed as public bodies is, is an issue for the ONS. They, they are looking at it. But if, if, and I wouldn't want to speculate on how likely that is um, you know, to happen, but there, there are a series of choices to be made in that if, if the ONS were to decide that they were part of the public sector, then there would be a series of steps that government or others could make to move them out of the public sector to change you know, degrees of control over whatever, whatever issue it was that um, led them to you know, believe that we were part of the public sector. So I think that's one of the things that um, I would expect the government would look at in phase two um, of the enterprise and skills review. But that is that is an issue where you know, there are choices to be made. But the, the change in the governance regime yeah. certainly potentially pushes it in that direction. Is that your understanding? Um, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. Um, I mean, the, at the time, um, the, there was quite a lot of concern at the time that you know, colleges became part of the public sector over the impact on charity states and so on. There are ways in which you can react to that and you know, avoid those consequences without going into the, the huge detail of it here. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean... For, for example, been, uh, what sorts of steps? Yeah. What together? I think mainly to do with the degree of control that government has over bodies. Right. Yeah. OK. Right. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll move on to the LCM now, unless anybody's got any other questions there. Liz, you... Uh, perhaps I could direct this to <clears throat> Dr Fancy. Um, I think you were present in the room when uh, our previous panel were giving... Uh, evidence on the concerns about the LCM. Yeah. Uh, do you share the concerns that were raised this morning? We do share a considerable number of the concerns that were raised this morning as we put in our most recent submission to the committee of, of uh, uh, relatively recently. Uh, and so yes, we absolutely share many of the concerns around the, the, the desire that we all have in Scotland to see that the UK body that will be um, overarching the research councils as we currently know them in their new form 
will properly reflect UK-wide policy considerations and that individual research councils will be able to respond to the needs of the entire country, including uh, this part that, that we are in in Scotland. To the concerns that were raised earlier, I'd, I'd add one that I don't think was mentioned maybe perhaps quite as, as explicitly as, as I would, but uh, it was an oversight and I'll, I'll add it now, I think, which is that the the function of the UKRI body that will oversee this new um, over, overarching body, one of the ways in which we would hope that that body could be helped to operate in the way that my colleagues earlier uh, spoke to you about and, and uh, which I would largely agree with, one of the ways in which that could be made more, more effective for us in Scotland is if it remained relatively slim. So we were pleased with John Kingman's reassurance, John Kingman, the shadow executive chair of this new body, his reassurance that he saw that as being a relatively light body who's, which would not have a large amount of policy and strategy staff and activity going on within it. And it's in that space that I think danger could potentially lie. And it would be good to see his uh, suggestion of a slim overarching body carried forward and, and if it could be uh, made as clear as possible in the process of creating a new body. Okay, thank you. Um, did you agree with the point that uh, Professor Yellowlees made when she said when it came to the research uh, councils uh, that she would like to see Scottish representation on each of them? Is that a point that you would agree with? The, yes. The, the research councils have operated very well for so many years for all of us in the UK and particularly as we've reflected on uh, more than once this morning already for us in Scotland, partly because they are directly responsive to and indeed um, work very closely with the research communities that they serve. So the history of those research councils bringing into their boards, their committees, their advisory structures, experts in their various disciplines from across the UK is one we would very much like to see maintained. So whatever the governance structures in the research councils or, or committees or however they are termed uh, post-change, however those governance structures are arranged, we would very much like to see uh, that, that uh, openness and drawing on the ability, the um, uh, researchers from across the UK to be to be uh, maintained too. Okay. Clearly, one one of the outstanding features of Scottish universities have been the fact that they have been able to attract top class research funding. In fact, uh, as a percentage share uh, greater than we might expect. Could you tell us what specific qualities it is within the Scottish universities that you believe make that possible? <coughs> Thank you. Well. Uh, Clearly, there are some extremely good people working in our Scottish universities, uh, extremely good people from all across Scotland, all across the United Kingdom and from around the world who have chosen to build their careers in our excellent universities. And that is uh, naturally the strongest possible component of their success. But there are some structural advantages that I think we have in Scotland which have been extremely valuable. One of those is an, an incredibly collaborative culture. So the ways in which Scottish universities work with each other, both at disciplinary levels and through University Scotland as a sector, is a very uh, distinct strength of our system. And we in the Funding Council working with the universities have acted at various points over the years to try to support that and nurture it, both through the research pooling initiative, for example, and more recently to the collaborative work we've been doing on all manner of things from entrepreneurship to innovation support. Collaboration, therefore, is a very important feature of a system that supports that excellence. Uh, how comfortable are you that the Westminster government recognises the strengths of the Scottish uh, institutions in this respect? I mean, do you feel confident that they really do recognise that that's something that must not be lost? I think the discussion that we, this committee has had with the previous panel and is having now with us reflects the fact that we are not complacent at all that the changes from the Research Council and uh, HEFKE and Innovate UK system into one that brings those together that there is a concern that our distinctiveness and our ability to operate in ways that are, are different and effective could be not less recognised. We also welcome the, the letter that appeared overnight that uh, shows that in the formation of UKRI, some consideration is proposed to be given to the diversity of the UK's research and innovation cultures. And it's hugely important that, uh, well, that's a great step, but as we said this morning, it, it could go further and, and give us even more such reassurance. We, we agreed earlier that it would be helpful uh, to have a united front on supporting further amendments. That's something that the Scottish Funding Council would welcome. 
Most definitely, and I think you could, the committee can see from the submissions you've had from various parties, including the ones you heard from earlier and, and ourselves, that we are of very, very similar minds and indeed share the views of ministers in their representations to uh, their colleagues in Westminster that there are safeguards and structural provisions that we would like to see in, in the bill uh, if there can be, and certainly there are operating protocols and practices we definitely want to see in addition. Thank you. Thanks very much, Liz. Does anybody else have any other questions in the LCN? In that case, can I thank the panel very much for their attendance this morning and their evidence, and that closes the public session. Thank you. <laughs>